Okay, the recording has started, so we're going to go forward with our lecture. Just going to go ahead and share the PDF that we were looking at. All right, so we just spoke about Abraham's blessings that in Christ we receive what God has promised to Abraham, right? And, uh, and you know, no, no, uh, there have been times when I've heard people, you know, they say, how can you say that, you know, uh, Abraham's blessings are on you and, and that we have Abraham's blessings? And, and, and I, you know, actually it's pretty simple because Paul states it right here in, in Galatians 3.29. He says, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. That means he's saying you are the seed that's being ref referenced here in uh, Galatians 3.16. And then you, uh, you inherit the promise. Your heirs according to the promise. Or it means you just inherit the promise. So it's the promise is yours. So... Galatians 3.29, you know, very explicitly tells us that the blessings of the blessings God spoke to Abraham are available to us as well. So let's go forward then. Um, what else do we see that's available to us in Christ? And uh, we, we, we have seen this before, but I just to bring our attention to it uh, uh, is that there is Grace, enabling grace that is in Christ Jesus, in Christ. So Paul is telling Timothy, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So he's telling Timothy to be strong in the grace that is in Christ. That means, you know, strengthen yourself in the grace that's available to you in Jesus Christ. That means it's the grace of God on us that strengthens us, empowers us, enables us. So um, the grace of God does uh, a lot of things. God's favor, God's grace on our lives. Uh, it, 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 it gives us what we do not deserve. And the grace of God also empowers us or enables us to be strong. So we can be strong by the grace that is in Jesus Christ. So how do we tap into that? You know, whenever you feel, uh, you know, uh, you need to be strengthened, you say, God, I pray you'll give me grace. I pray uh, that the grace that's in, in Jesus empower me for this situation. God, I thank you for grace on my life as I do this uh, assignment, as I do this work, as I carry out this task. Lord, I thank you for grace that enables me, right? Because that grace is in Christ Jesus, already there for you and me. And we can be strengthened by that grace. And we can be empowered by that grace. So we need to tap into it. So we just say, God, I thank you that your grace enables me, that your grace empowers me um, in this assignment, in this task, in whatever I have to do. Right? We tap in to the grace that is ours. Um, a few more things here is that in Christ, we have the promise of resurrection, right? Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, uh, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ. So he's talking about what is available to us in Christ. In Christ, all will be made alive. So obviously he's talking about physical resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, that whole chapter, or the latter part of that chapter, is all about physical resurrection from the dead. So he's saying, in Christ, all will be made alive. And uh, we see this in another places also in First Thessalonians 4.16. Uh, Paul writes, he says, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. The dead in Christ will rise first. So we have the promise of resurrection, that we will be raised physically and be, because we are in Christ. And the last two things that we want to talk about is um, we will reign with him. That means this is a promise we have. Uh, when Jesus 
returns and he establishes his kingdom on the earth. We refer to it as the millennial kingdom. We read about it in Revelation 24 and we also see it in Daniel chapter 7. In the millennial kingdom, we who are in Christ, all the saints, all the saints, the Old Testament saints and us, we will reign with Jesus here on earth. So this is a promise that we have, that in that kingdom for a thousand years, we will reign with Jesus here on earth. And we will help administer his kingdom here on earth, his literal kingdom, right? So that's, uh, we read about that in Revelation 20. Uh, we'll study more about that and the end times and so on in a, in, our, in a separate course in the second year when we talk about the end times we will get into that so conclusion uh, we have seen all these things that are that we have in Christ what must we do Paul writes in Philemon 1 6 he says that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you, in Christ Jesus. So, uh, I just want to emphasize this part. The acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you. You know, what must we do? We must acknowledge every good thing which is in us. Acknowledge it. Acknowledge means to recognize as a fact. To affirm as truth. So you acknowledge the good things that are in you because you are in Christ Jesus. You acknowledge that. You say, God, I thank you. Christ has made unto me wisdom. I thank you. I am in Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I thank you that I can. I am strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I thank you that I have received your abundant grace and your gift of righteousness and I reign in life through Christ. So you acknowledge every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Acknowledge the good things. Right Now, that's what we do when we come to the sharing of our faith. So uh, we do this for each other also. Right? So that the fellowship of our faith. So when we fellowship with other people, when we share our faith with other people, how can our fellowship become effective? How can it become effective? We must acknowledge every good thing which is in us in Christ. So, you know, uh, if you are uh, you know, just talking to another believer and, uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe they're going through a difficult time or some struggles, whatever, you know, then what must we do? We must acknowledge the good things that are in them in Christ Jesus, right? So we say, look, I know there's grace available for you and you can be strengthened by grace. I know that you are complete in Christ and the fullness of God's available for you. Uh, I know that you know you are an overcomer and God will cause you to triumph. What are we doing? We are acknowledging the good things that are in them, in Christ. And so the sharing of our faith will become really effective. That's, that's when it's going to be true, effective fellowship. When we acknowledge the good things that are in us, in each other, in Christ Jesus. So when you say, no, or when you pray for that person, you pray, a recognizing, calling forth, acknowledging, affirming the good things that are in them because they are, in Christ Jesus, you know, and then they would really be feel they will really feel refreshed. Uh, they will really feel that uh, the that that fellowship in the faith was very productive, was very effective. Why? Because you chose to acknowledge the good things that are in them, because they are in Christ. Rather than calling out their weaknesses and failures, call out what God can do in them and through them, because they are in Christ. The same thing, you do that for yourself. You do that when you um, share faith with other believers. Okay, So that brings us to the end of this 
particular chapter, and we're going to get into the next one, which is you know, that we are one body in Christ. Let me pause here and before we start this one, this section and to see if there are any thoughts or any questions from anybody. Any questions? Everything's fine? Okay, there we go ahead. Um, Pastor, thank you. Uh, in the last verse that we went through, is it only in the context of um, sharing faith with other believers? Or is it also in the context of uh, unbelievers? Mm. Yeah, the context there is uh, other believers um, because really if you you know, if you look at the background of the letter uh, Paul is writing this letter to Philemon uh, I mean if you just quickly understand the story what happened was Paul was in Rome and uh, he was in under house house arrest in Rome and um, uh, oh, um, I, he had a friend called Philemon uh, who was actually in uh, in I think in uh, in Colossae, in the the place called Colossae. I think if I if I'm not mistaken, right? So now Philemon had a servant, uh, a young man who was serving in his house. His name was Onesimus, and Onesimus perhaps did something wrong, and maybe he stole some money or whatever, and he ran away. And he escaped from Philemon's house. And he escapes all the way to Rome. And, you know, it's just amazing how God works. I mean, he ends up in Rome and he gets in touch with the Apostle Paul. And when Paul meets him, Paul ministers to him, uh, leads him to the Lord, and, uh, you know, like, just uh, spiritually restores him. And then he sends Onesimus back to Philemon along with this letter, which is the short epistle of Philemon, which we just read. And basically in that epistle, he's telling Philemon, Philemon, I want you to receive Onesimus back, but as a brother, and acknowledge the good things that are in him. Now, let the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you, in Christ Jesus. So that's the context. He's saying, you know, look at Onesimus now as a brother, because now he's in Christ. And call out the good things that are in him. So really the context is, you know, two people uh, sharing their faith uh, together in Christ. Yeah. Okay. Thank, you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, uh, so that brought us to the end of uh, chapter ten, which was about you know the blessings, the all the things that are available to us in Christ. So now we're going to shift to another section, and in this section, what we want to emphasize is that because we are all in Christ. We're all in Christ. We are part of one body. Christ has one body. And we're all part of that one body in Christ. And so, you know, we just want to touch upon some aspects of being one body in Christ and, you know, living out uh, of that understanding that we are all one body in Christ. So that's what we will do in this um, section. So let me go ahead, uh, share the PDF. All right, so we are one body in Christ. So let's, uh, could somebody read these two verses for us? Galatians 3, 27, 28, and Colossians 3, 11, please. Galatians chapter 3, 27 to 28. For as many of you as are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Colossians chapter 3 verse 11. There is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, sapient, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Mm. Amen. Thank you. 
So the Apostle Paul is bringing our attention to something. He says, look, we're all baptized into Christ. That means we're all immersed uh, into Jesus. And we have put on Christ. So that, that means, you know, we all, you know, if, you know, just imagine if all of us had to wear, you know, the same kind of clothing. He said, okay, then outwardly, you know, we all look the same. All, all of us wore, you know, blue shirts or something. You know, Oh, all these people, they all look the same, they're all wearing blue, you know. But here he's saying, look, we're all baptized into Christ and we're all wearing the same thing. We're all, we have all put on Christ. So all of us look like that. And then he says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. This has to do with our race, you know, uh, no Jew, no Greek. Neither slave nor free. This, this has to do with our social position or status. There's neither male nor female that has to do with that gender. It says you're all one in Christ Jesus. All one in Christ. So it says in Christ, we are all one. All one in the sense we are all equal. We are all the same. We are all baptized into Christ. Right? So spiritually, regardless of our uh, physical, social, or, uh, you know, those, those, those natural identities that we have, regardless, all that is left is kept aside. And in Christ, we are all one. We are co-equal. We are equally loved by God. We are equally blessed by God. We are all one in Christ. And, you know, he repeats that there in Colossians 3.11. He says the same thing. You know, there's no Jew or Greek or um, the, we're all, it's, it's all about Christ. We're all about Christ. So uh, our being in Christ has made us one with everyone else who's in Christ. And, and that, this is so beautiful because, you know, when we meet people who, believers who, come from different backgrounds, uh, whether, you know, whether it's racial, whether it's social, whatever, they are different backgrounds. We can still, you know, we can see each other as one, you know, and we can relate to each other. Of course, we all are different in the natural. Naturally, we, are, we have our differences, uh, but in Christ, we are together. We are one, and therefore we can you know, uh, respect each other. Uh, we can treat each other with honor. We can treat each other equally. Uh, and we can, you know, walk together. We can float together because we're all one in Christ. And there's an interesting thing here in, in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 16. Now, Paul says, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Interesting statement he makes. He says, you know, from now on, uh, uh, we are not looking at the outward, per, outward, um, outward or external factors. Uh, you know, when we are relating to each other, he says, we regard no one according to the flesh, according to the natural. You know, uh, why? Because when we are in Christ, we're all new creation. No, we're all new creation. And we are one in Christ. Our focus is on Christ and who we are in Christ. And this is what God's plan is also. You know, what did God plan in Ephesians 1 verse 10? God planned that he will gather together in one Every, all things or everyone in Christ, you know, uh, he wanted us, wanted to gather all of us, those of us who are in heaven, those of us who are on earth. His plan is, look, I'm going to gather everybody together in Christ, whether you're Gentiles, uh, we all partake of his promise 
in Christ. Right? So we all share in that same promise that's available to us in Christ. So that's something to keep in mind and something for us to practice that when we meet just anybody who is in Christ, you know, we are equal, treat each other equal, love them, respect them, honor them, uh, bless them, because we are all one in Christ, in Him. And that's the way God sees us, and that's the way we must look at each other in Christ. Now, being part of God's body means that we are also God's dwelling place. It's a place where God dwells, right? Could somebody read this for us? Colossians 1, uh, Colossians 2, 21 and 22. I know it splits over two pages, but if you, uh, sorry, Ephesians 2, 21, 22, please. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 21. In whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Verses 22. In whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in spirit. Amen. Thank you. Notice in both, both these verses, you have in whom, in whom. So he's talking about something that has to do with being in Christ. He also mentions in the Lord once again, in the Lord. In the spirit. Right? So it all has to do with us being in Christ. He says, in Christ, the whole building. So he's in his mind, he's having this picture of a building. And he's saying, he's saying in Christ, it's like God is raising up this building. And he's putting us all together. And this building really is a holy temple, a holy temple. So in Christ, we are all part of one body. And we are all being assembled into a building, which is really a holy temple in the Lord. And, and this holy temple, God is building together to dwell for a dwelling place of God. This is for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit or by the Spirit. So what's Paul telling us? He's saying, you know, all of us who are in Christ, God has put us all together, and we are being built up into a holy temple where God himself is going to dwell by his Spirit. And obviously this is a spiritual thing. It's not like a physical temple that God is building, but it's a spiritual temple that God is building and God himself is going to dwell in that. So here's the second thing we must understand. We are in Christ. That means we are all together a dwelling place of God. Now you can think about this locally, you can think about this globally. Locally means uh, in, 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 your, in your city or town or wherever you dwell, uh, you are, uh, you are part of uh, the body of Christ right there, uh, along with other believers who are living in that area. And spiritually, all of us believers in that particular area, we make up the dwelling place of God over there. So like that, you know, all of us are in different places in the world. And we are part of the body of believers in our respective towns or cities. And they are collectively in the spirit, we are the dwelling place of God. And of course, this is true even globally, that we are all together like living stones. You know, we are built 
uh, into a spiritual house uh, or the same picture of a house or a building uh, and, and we offer up spiritual sacrifices to God. So keep that in mind that because you are in Christ, you are part of this holy temple. You are part of this holy temple. If you want to, you can envision that as you are one of those bricks in that building. We are all those you know, individual bricks in that building. And uh, that's being built into this spiritual house or this dwelling place of God, this holy temple. Now, what are the implications of that? First of all, each one of us must do our part to keep the temple holy. So God uh, dwells in his temple and his temple is holy. It's got to be kept clean. It's got to be kept consecrated, uh, separate from sin, separate from evil and wickedness. So, uh, you know, Paul writes, he says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So it's like you are the temple of God and God's dwelling in you. So he's writing to the believers at Corinth and he's telling them you are the temple of God and God is dwelling in you. And the temple of God is holy, and you are that temple. So we should be careful that none of us defile the temple. Right? Say, so, okay, you know, I'm going to, I personally am going to walk holy because I want to keep the temple of God holy, and I'm part of that temple. I'm one of those bricks. And if I defile myself, it's the whole temple that's going to be defiled because one of the bricks in the temple is defiled, right? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to keep myself holy so that the temple of God can be kept holy. So each one of us must do our part to keep the temple holy. Secondly, we understand that, you know, we are God's dwelling place. We are where God dwells. And we establish God's presence in our community. Now, can somebody read Psalm 132, 13 to 18? It's, it's, it's a beautiful passage here. Can somebody read that for us, please? Psalm 132, 13 to 18. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will also clothe her priests with salvation, and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. There I will make the horn of David grow. I will prepare a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but upon himself his crown shall flourish. Amen. Thank you. So, the Lord has chosen Zion. Now, Zion is a very interesting term. In the Old Testament, um, it actually, you know, Zion is actually, oh, is actually a mount or a mount, um, so not a mountain, but a small hill. So a mount called Mount Zion, uh, just outside Jerusalem, Mount Zion. Um, so David... Uh, when he, King David, when he, during his time, he uh, kind of included Mount Zion as part of his uh, capital. Uh, and so, you know, uh, eventually it became part of Jerusalem. And eventually Zion uh, was, was a name that was more associated in, in Scripture, as you progress in Scripture. Uh, the word Zion then becomes associate, associated with the people of God. So when it refers to Zion, uh, which was actually the name of a mount, as you progress past, you know, kings and so on, and chronicles, and you come into the prophets, uh, Zion there is used to refer to the people 
of God. And then when you come into the New Testament, when you go into Hebrews chapter 12, uh, and I think it's like around verse 26, 28, around that, the word Zion is referred to the people of God in the New Testament. So the word Zion is important. So the Old Testament Zion refers, is, is a parallel to the New Testament church, right? Uh, you see that in Hebrews 12. Anyway, so what I want to point out is, so God says the Lord has chosen Zion. So God is like choosing. Hey, I, I, I want I want to live there. He has decided for his dwelling place, his dwelling place. So God is saying, I, I want to dwell there. So really he says, I want to dwell among my people. Because remember, Zion refers to the people of God. God says, I want to dwell among there, among my people. He says, this is my resting place. I mean, I, I want to come and I want to settle down here. My resting place. Here I will dwell because I have desired it. So God desires to dwell among his people. And sure enough, when you come into the New Testament, as we've read the scriptures, uh, the New Testament believers are being built up into God's dwelling place by his spirit. So God dwells and, and God wants to dwell among his people. He says, here I will dwell. I have decided. it. And what does he do where, what, when God dwells among his people? What does he do? This is what he does. I will. He says, I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. So God's saying, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care of all their needs. I'm going to live with them. And I will take care of all their needs. Then he says, I will clothe her priests with salvation. So I'll give them salvation. That word salvation simply means, you know, everything. Healing, deliverance, victory, uh, safety, protection. So that's all included in that word salvation. I will clothe her priests with salvation. That is, I will bless all the people there with salvation. Her saints will shout aloud for joy. Why? Because they're all going to experience salvation. They're going to just be full of joy. And he says, there I will make the horn of David grow. The horn of David, the horn simply represents strength. It represents uh, dominion or leadership. So I will cause the horn of David, I will cause his influence, his strength, his dominion to increase, to grow. He says, I will prepare uh, a lamp for my anointed. That means I'll give them a light lamp. It's symbolic of light, guidance, understanding, revelation. Everything a light does, I'll give a lamp for my anointed. His enemies, I will clothe with shame. That means I'll give him victory over his enemies. But upon himself, his crown will flourish. I mean, he's going to extend his rule and dominion. What I want you to notice is, when God says, I will dwell here, then where he dwells, he does all these things. He says, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. That means, I will do these things for the people among whom I dwell. Now, it's, it's like we're not trying to convince God. He says, hey, I've come to dwell with you and I'll take care of all these things. Just leave it to me. You know? So it's an amazing thing that in the New Testament, we are God's dwelling place. We are established his presence. And among whom he dwells, he does all these things. He takes care of all our needs. He covers us with salvation, gives us joy. He increases our strength, our influence, our dominion. He gives us light, revelation, guidance, and he gives us victory over our enemies. And he causes us to flourish. God does this. So think about it. As one body in Christ, as God's people, and in, in your local church community, so you can apply this to your local church. In your local church community, you are God's dwelling place there. And you can expect 
God to do these things. God, you're dwelling in our midst. You're dwelling amongst us by your spirit. And we want you to do these things, God. You said you will do these and we invite you to do these things. And God himself offered to do it. You know, I will, he said. So we just invite him to do these things. And one more uh, implication of us being the dwelling place of God, I think uh, a great example uh, is to uh, is is symbolized here in First Samuel five, one to four. Could somebody read First Samuel five one to four for us, please? When the um, then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of. Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set it in its place again. And when they arose early the next morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. The head of Dagon and both the palms of its hands were broken off on the threshold. Only Dagon's torso was left of it. Mm. Let's think about that. So the Ark of God. The Ark of God in the Old Testament was a physical box. Right? It was a wooden box. It was covered with gold. And inside the Ark were the tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments, and uh, Aaron's rod, and so it was kept inside. And the ark, this box, this ark of the car, on top of it was the mercy seat. Um, this was uh, a symbol of God's presence for the people. Right? And uh, here the enemies, the Philistines, they took the ark. They captured it. And of course they recognized that this was a piece of furniture that was, uh, was uh, religious or you know, was spiritual in nature. And so they took the Ark of God and they brought it to the temple of Dagon, the God they worshipped. So they took this Ark of God, put it in the house of Dagon. And when they came the next morning, Dagon was fallen on his face. They picked up the statue of Dagon, put it back. Came back the next day, the statue was fallen and this time it was broken. Head and the palms of Dagon was broken. So it's very interesting, right? You've got a symbol of God's presence, and where the presence of God is, uh, the powers of darkness fall. It's just a very symbolic message, but a very powerful message. Now, uh, here uh, in the New Testament, uh, we don't uh, have physical objects like the Ark of God, but uh, the church, the body, we are the dwelling place of God, and that's what we're talking about. And it, when we establish God's presence, when we are uh, hosting God's presence, and we become the temple where God is dwelling, what can we expect? We can expect demonic strongholds in our city to, de to be destabilized, to be shaken, to fall, because we are the dwelling place of God by his spirit. Right? So this is a powerful symbolic image of uh, what happens when the presence of God is hosted somewhere by his people. Okay. Another important part of us being one body in Christ is that um, we as believers, when we come together uh, to partake of the communion, the Lord's table, we are actually proclaiming something very powerful, right? So let's uh, read these three verses. Could somebody do that, please? First Corinthians 10, 16 and 17 and 21. Could somebody read that for us? First Corinthians 10, 16 to 17 and verse 21. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the 
the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Hmm. So, um, Paul is um, teaching the believers, uh, giving them understanding about uh, the Lord's table, right? Uh, the or we refer to it as a communion of the Lord's table. So he says, you know, when we drink the cup, it's actually communion in the blood of Christ. That means we are fellowshipping, we are partaking, or we are receiving the blessing of the blood of Christ. That's why he calls it the cup of blessing. So when you drink that cup, you know, the grape juice that represents the blood, when you drink the cup, you are drinking blessing. It's called the cup of blessing. And what blessing are you drinking? It's the blessing that comes through the blood of Christ because that cup says you are communion, you're having fellowship, you are partaking of the blessing of the blood of Christ. Similarly, the bread is communion, fellowship or partnership or partaking in the body of Christ. That means, you know, whatever Jesus made available through his sacrifice of his body, we are receiving as we eat the bread. You're saying, I'm receiving it, I'm partaking, I'm, I'm fellowshipping, I'm receiving of what Christ made available to me through the sufferings he endured in his body. But not only that, so, you know, every individual believer eats the bread and drinks the cup. And they are saying, I'm receiving the blessing that comes through the blood of Christ and through the body of Christ. I'm individually receiving it, personally receiving it, which is wonderful. But there is more. He says, we though, we though many are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. So he says, now, not only is it each individual believer com having communion of the blood and the body of Christ, but it's also all of us becoming one bread and one body. That means we are all fell in fellowship with each other. We are blessing each other. We become one bread, one body, because we're all eating of that same bread. We're all receiving from that. And so therefore, it's also showing that we are in fellowship or we are in relationship with one another. We are like one bread. We are like one body, right? So the Lord's table, the communion is a powerful expression of us being one body in Christ. We are like one loaf of bread. You know, we, we, we're all part of that. Uh, it's an expression of our fellowship with one another. And therefore, in the light of all that, you know, I've skipped a few verses and uh, verse 21, he says, you know, you can't, you know, you can't fellowship with God and demons, basically. You can't, you know, have one feet with God and one, one foot there with the devil. You, you can't do that, right? We have to be 100% committed in one place, which is we're committed to the Lord's table. That means we're committed to receiving uh, from the body and the blood of Christ. And we recognize that we are one bread and one body with each other. Okay. So the next time you and I partake of the communion, keep this in mind. I am receiving the blessing that comes through the blood and through the body of Christ. But at the same time, I'm declaring that I'm one with everybody else who's eating this bread and drinking this cup. I'm saying, I'm one with them. We are together. We are part of the same body. And we all are eating of the same table, the Lord's tables. And there is spiritual unity that we share. Okay, so this is part of being in Christ. In Christ means we are in the body of Christ. And as part of his body, we said we are 
uh, yeah, we belong to the one body. We are God's dwelling place and we are one bread, one cup. We, we are together in Christ. Okay. And um, yeah, I was thinking, you know, should we? Okay, let's let me see any questions. All right. Uh, yeah, let's take some questions. I'm looking at Robert's question. I was wondering where the Ark of the Covenant got lost. There's a record about it in the New Testament. And so you said that it was there. And I don't know what happened to Palestinians. Okay. Um, so to answer the questions, you know, um, we don't know what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. So um, so uh, right there in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 5, 6, and 7, when you read those chapters, uh, at that time, at that time, what happened to the Philistine, Philistines was, uh, you know, uh, they, they eventually had a lot of trouble uh, having the Ark of the Covenant there. And so they just try to, they, try, they eventually try to send it back to Israel, the people, the Jewish people, and they received it back. Um, that's, you read about that in 1 Samuel 5, 6, 7. But we don't know what happened the Ark of the Covenant because what happened later on is after King Solomon, King Solomon built this beautiful temple in which the Ark of the Covenant was kept. Um, then came the Assyrians, uh, people of the north of Israel. They came and they attacked northern part of Israel. And subsequently, Nebuchadnezzar was king of Babylon. He came from Iraq. He attacked Jerusalem and he destroyed the temple. Uh, he destroyed everything. And he took a lot of the utensils, things that were part of the temple back with him to Babylon. So that was, you know, the first destruction of Sol the temple, Solomon's temple, the temple that Solomon built, uh, which took place, um, uh, you know, which, which happened during the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. So it's, you know, it's quite possible uh, things may have been destroyed at that time. The temple was completely destroyed. And then, you know, uh, the temple was rebuilt um, during the time of Ezra, uh, the scribe. So they, after the Babylonian captivity, 70 years, they came back and they rebuilt the temple. And uh, so, it's referred to as Solomon's second temple. Um, uh, the second temple was rebuilt, but that uh, uh, and, and King Herod, that is during Jesus' time, uh, King Herod renovated that temple. Uh, and then, but that temple was again destroyed in AD 70 by the Roman emperor, right? So, and, but, so you know, and then thereafter a mosque was built uh, in the place of the temple. Uh, and that's what we have standing today in Jerusalem. On the Temple Mount, you have the uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque and you have the Dome of the Rock, both of which are, uh, uh, which belong to Muslims. So on that same place where there used to be Solomon's Temple and is today stands a mosque and a dome. So to answer your question, we don't know what happened. Uh, it's probably been destroyed, you know, possibly during Nebuchadnezzar's invasion. Okay, there your question. Yeah, Pastor, it's regarding First Corinthians 10, 1 to 4, where it talks about uh, the same spiritual food and same spiritual drink that, uh, yeah, the Israelites uh, 
hot mm. opinion. So I just wanted to know what is the spiritual food and drink mentioned there? And is it related to the one bread and the one cup mentioned in verse, uh, these verses that we were discussing? Okay, okay. Yeah, so uh, in, in, in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, Paul uh, uh, brings the attention of the people uh, to what happened to Israel as they came out of the promised land, right? And uh, so basically uh, this sum, sum, summation or the summary of those verses is, hey, we can learn from their example and we shouldn't make the same mistakes that they made, which kept them out of the promised land. That's uh, the early part of First Corinthians 10. And while he mentions that, then he talks about the fact that uh, they had spiritual food and they had spiritual drink. The spiritual food, of course, refers to the manna which God sent them. The reason he calls it spiritual food is because it came from God, right? It wasn't something they made, but God gave them spiritual food and they drank uh, the spiritual drink. But what he, he, what Paul brings out is that Christ was with them because he says that rock was Christ. They all ate the same spiritual food and they all drank the same spiritual drink out of that that rock and that spiritual rock and that rock was Christ. So he's saying Jesus was with them and that rock was a type of Christ. Um, now, uh, is it the same thing as uh, uh, the, the body and the blood of Christ? Or let, let's put it like this, what is the similarity? So it, it is not the same thing in the sense that was manna and that was water. And here we are talking about um, bread and juice, which represent Jesus. There it was um, manna and water, which quenched their physical needs, right? Uh, so um, what is this? Uh, so, it is, it, it, so in that sense, it is different. Uh, but in, in what are the similarities? The similarities are just as they were all made one through that whole experience. Like he says, they were all baptized in the cloud in Moses. So uh, it, it made them one as, as one people of God. And they, they ate and they drank uh, the spiritual meal or provision that God gave. So also here, we're all made one in Christ. We eat the same bread and we drink the same cup and we are made one one in Christ. So that would be the similarity, right? That uh, through this whole experience, they were baptized in the cloud, they ate and drank together, and they were all baptized into Moses, meaning they, they were identified in the, their leader. It was Moses. Here, we're all made one, and we identified in Christ. Um, but the, the elements are different. You know, one was man on water. Here it is bread and juice, which are symbolic of the sacrificial death of Christ himself. Right? So in that sense, they are different. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. So, um, um, so uh, uh, next year, next next semester, we'll talk about uh, in our course on hermeneutics, which is interpreting scripture. We'll talk about types and shadows. So here's one example of a type, uh, meaning there is something in the Old Testament which the New Testament points back to and says hey, that has spiritual meaning for us. But the danger with the type is you only have to stay with what the New Testament is telling about the Old Testament and we shouldn't add to meaning to it. So in this passage, the type that's being pointed to is the rock. That rock was Christ. Right? So what is the type that's being pointed to? That rock. Another type that's being pointed to is they were all baptized in the cloud into Moses. So baptism, okay, that's another type. Right? Uh, but uh, beyond this, we shouldn't read meaning into that passage. Okay, I, I just realized time is up and <laughs> before I could answer the question. Okay, uh, yeah, we will continue. We will discuss this uh, next uh, semester. Okay, let's close in prayer, please. Somebody could just pray and uh, we will dismiss. I'm sorry, I've already gone over time. Could somebody qu quickly pray and dismiss us, please?
Please go ahead, uh, Collins. Father in heaven, we thank you for today, and we thank you for this wonderful space we are in, Lord. It's different times in wherever we are. Early here in Rwanda, it is still it's almost 7.30, and I think that side is almost 11 something. So yeah. Lord, we do pray. We thank you for everything, for the lecture, for the pastor, and for my colleagues who are online, Father. Father, we do know that this is for the good and for the better and for the best of our mm -hmm. own souls as we are trying to experience our standing in Christ. So, Lord, please bless everybody. Bless the past, bless the pastor's family, our families, all of us, as mm -hmm. we, we, we wait to see him sent to us ourselves and other things. Pray in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit. Everybody says, <clears throat> Amen. Amen. Thank you, Collins. Thank you, everybody. Uh, sorry I took your time. Um, have a quick break and join your class. Thank you. God bless. And see you again. Thank you.